Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're discussing the work of Engender Health, a leading global health organization committed to advancing gender equality with a focus on sexual and reproductive health and rights with our very special guest, Tracy Baird, CEO of Engender Health, and Sakai Chicoero, Vice President of Programs for the organization. Thank you both for joining us. It is just wonderful, wonderful to have you. Thanks so much for having us, Mark. It's fun to be here this morning. Oh, well, I, I'm really looking forward to this. The The thing that I really am interested in is, is how you go about um, both providing uh, various services, connecting with people, getting them engaged on the one hand, but also respecting local sensibilities on the other. So the, the, this whole idea where it's not a top-down, but it's center-out approach, and where listening is is important is as important as conveying, sharing is as important as uh, being able to bring technical expertise. So, Tracy, could you just give us a, a, a full-on overview of Engender Health, of how you're organized, your constituents, your people, uh, your operations? I'd be happy to start with that. And um, I like how you talk about the center out approach. I think that's exactly right. So we've been working uh, for more than 50 years. We've worked in more than 100 countries on the, the broad remit of sexual and reproductive health and rights. And I'll dig in a little bit to what that means to us and what that means to our partners. But I'll say that right now we're in about 16 countries, um, mostly in Sub-Saharan Africa and in, in South Asia and India. And we partner with governments, with international and local um, not NGOs, non-governmental organizations like ourselves. We partner with medical and nursing associations, with community groups, um, with um, individuals. And it's that partnership approach that allows us to really contextualize the work that we do. So we are not bringing uh, a, a project that we design in a conference room or in a, in a virtual Zoom meeting to a community. We're working with our partners, whether it's a ministry of health or um, a, an adolescent uh, led, a youth led organization that's working on advocacy and rights. And we bring what we know from our years of experience, meld it with what our partners know and their enormous expertise to work and, and have impact. And our three primary impact areas are, as I mentioned, sexual and reproductive health and rights. And a lot of our work there is around contraception or family planning, as some people say, um, and abortion and post-abortion care. We have a whole impact area on maternal health, and we have an impact area related to gender-based violence. And so these areas really weave together. They're, they themselves are intersections, and then we link to areas beyond that. But we bring all of that expertise to our projects and our projects might be a multi-country global project on safe surgery and obstetrics, for example, making cesarean sections safer, or we'll have a project related to linking contraceptive care to HIV services. And we have a project that is about bringing sports and games to adolescents and using those sports and games as a vehicle for sharing information about their health and about their rights and working with young people to really uh, boost their role in their communities. But I think what's common to all of the work that we do is our ability to work with partners to, as I mentioned, contextualize the work um, to make sure that we're using what we call our gender lens to look and, and understand the impact of gender inequality in a community or in a system or in a policy that has negative impacts on people's health and rights, and then use our work to increase equality, to really boost up women and girls especially, to make sure that they can live their, their full lives and really communicate to their communities. Um, so we lean into those partnerships. We work to share and learn together with our partners. As you said, center out, right? We're trying to, we're always trying to contribute and learn and um, build things together with our partners. And that allows us to have enormous impact. In our last program year, we supported more than 1.1 million people to use the contraceptive method of their choice. 
And we worked with local partners to advocate for uh, 18 different policy changes that are making their the countries or regions better places um, for advancing health and rights. So we do that with our partners um, and we do that around the world and and we are thrilled to be able to share that experience with you today. One of the things that, that really fascinates me, um, Sakai, you know, about what Tracy said is this idea of connecting reproductive rights to the civil life that people in general, but women in particular, um, live within their societies. It seems to me that that modernity does violence uh, to women in a way that it doesn't do violence to men. It's different. Could you talk a little bit about your perspective of this idea of women taking um, control of their reproductive health, their sexual uh, lives, their um, their place in society um, through these types of collaborations and and talk a little bit about how you see this being done in a way that is consistent with local sense of sensibilities. Thank you for the opportunity to share. Um, it's in gender health, we take a holistic approach to gender equality, uh, focusing on a high quality integrated programming that meets the most pressing needs of women and girls in all their diversity, including sexual and reproductive health and rights, maternal health and gender-based violence. Uh, we are working to put women in leadership of the issues that affect their lives, that affect their health, that affect their communities. The work that we do, we apply an intersectional approach, an inclusive lens to ensure that our programming is equitable and addresses the needs of marginalized and underserved communities. We design and implement complementary and integrated interventions that address some of the most pressing needs in society. While some of the activities uh, can be easily counted and quantified, some of the work that we do around gender equality uh, cannot be quantified because these are things that influence an individual's behavior, how they think, how they engage, and how they advocate for themselves and have agency for the issues that affect them. And to that end, some of the work that we do, which is very impactful, uh, is not quantifiable, but is very pivotal in shifting social norms and empowering communities. You know, this is this is really interesting because you started off, I, I was listening very intently. You started off with a very subtle but so such an important point. It's it's the shift in power. And it's not an imposed shift in power, it's the uh, it's the making space for power to be taken. Am I hearing that correctly? You are quite right. Uh the shift in power sharing and power shifting is a negotiation that goes on at different levels and different groups of people, both at societal level in the communities where we work between different genders, but also between people with different levels of power, whether people in leadership at community level or leadership at government level where policies are made. This shift is a negotiated um, arrangement because the person holding the power, the, uh, the, the higher end of the power, has to be willing to engage with the weaker party. And also the weaker party has to have the agency to understand and know what they want, which is where we come in as in gender health. Our work at the intersections of health and other critical global health issues ensures that the most marginalized, that is the people, for example, with disabilities or women, uh, affected by fistula and young people are not only included, but meaningfully engaged. In some ways, we are literally joining people at the intersections or the crossroads where sectors come together to save the whole person, not just one aspect. 
So Tracy, part of this is self-advocacy, right? And and it's 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 not only about the technical aspects of women's reproductive health or or um, or agency over their their sexual lives. It's also just sort of agency. It's being able to articulate and advocate for self. How do you how do you cultivate that within your own organization, right? Because you have such a diverse group of people from different cultures, from different places, from different perspectives. How do you ensure that there's agency as opposed to the typical sort of top-down hierarchical thing where, you know, everybody sort of falls in line, right? There needs to be rowing together, but they're also, in this type of an organization in particular, there needs to be some form of, of very considered um, sort of space for, for power to be expressed. Yes, and I think, Mark, that really starts with setting strategy and being clear about our collective goals. That's the rowing together part. So we set as our our North Star is gender equality. That's where we're going with everything that we do. And our, our means to that end are programs in sexual and reproductive health and rights and maternal health and gender equality. But we all know where we are going. And then we hire the best and brightest and most wonderful staff around the world. Our staff are senior professionals in their countries who are leading from within their cultural contexts, plural, because, you know, we these are like every com- country and community, right? There are multiple cultures and, and a lot going on in that context. 30, 40 languages in some countries. Oh, right? absolutely. And, and we have staff that speak so many of them. Um, but they're they're leading from within their their country, but they're also leading across, right? So we have global leaders who work across our geography. We have technical leaders who are based wherever they are, and that might be in Washington D.C. or or New Delhi or Kinshasa or Addis Ababa. And but they are leading across a scope of work and working collaboratively with the others internally and in gender health and our external partners and allies in this work to do that. And then we really design our policies to walk our talk around gender equality, inclusion, diversity, really valuing who we are. And that can be as sort of as sort of technical as making sure that all of our internal global meetings are simultaneously translated in English and French to make sure we're including uh, fully including and 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 fostering the participation of our French speaking staff in Francophone West Africa and Central Africa. And that can also mean some of the policies that we have, making sure that our hiring policies are are fair and just and and really leaning into some feminist leadership and governance approaches that I think really embody just not just the work that we do, but the way we want to do our work with our partners and ourselves with our staff. And what you're talking about is a level of sophistication, not only in terms of dealing with the cultural issues, but also the practical issues. You need to, for example, deal in multiple currencies. You have to deal with Mm -hmm. multiple uh, regulations, multiple traditions, not to mention the fact that much of Africa was cut up along these European arbitrary lines from the colonial period in which borders basically divide people. And when you're Sakai trying to serve people in a region, sometimes those particular borders don't necessarily define the the various um, cohesive uh, units of of, uh, communities. Um, So you have that to navigate. as as you're thinking about translating what what Tracy was just describing, um, uh, from an organizational perspective, and then you start to talk about uh, managing uh, on the ground. On the ground, are you dealing regionally? Are you dealing country specific? How how do you basically think about your operating units, or do you? come together and share as a whole? Um, How do you translate that sort of concept that Tracy was talking about into an on-the-ground operation with workflows and collaborations and and so forth? Uh, So to share a bit more about the setup of our programs um, in the communities where we work, 
depending on the objectives and the goals of the of the activity, you find who some projects. Those, um, excuse me for interrupting. Who sets those objectives and goals? Who who determines what those are? So going back to how we engage with communities, we co-create our programs with the people who stand to benefit uh, from the uh, outcomes of the project that we are implementing. If it is young people or it is women of reproductive uh, age or it is uh, gender-based violence uh, survivors, we co-create with women-led organizations and youth-led organizations. So the goals of the program, admittedly, some of them are working within the wide spectrum of what donors are interested in supporting, but it also answers to the needs of the people that are targeted by this support. And these are the groups and individuals that co-create the work with us when we are designing programs. And when we are looking at working at the intersections, we are working with other partners from other sectors that advance human development and the goals from the health perspective are aligned with the developmental goals, let's say in a nutrition program or in a WASH program or in a food security program. We are looking at goals that advance the human development and we are pulling our expertise together to answer to the needs of the individual. Uh, in many ways, you'd see that this work either is targeting a community in a country or it is regional. You mentioned borders. These are artificial uh, uh, barriers or demarcations. In terms of communities, they interact and intermarry and the cultures are common. And therefore you find that, for example, we have a project that is seeking to address gender-based violence in West Africa. And the program is regional, covering multiple countries because they share common cultures, they share common religion, and the social norms that serve as barriers and uh, perpetuate some of the harmful uh, traditional practices that uh, lead to gender-based violence are common across the countries. And therefore a program like that would be regional. But we also have multi-country programs like the Momentum Safe Surgeries uh, Project that Tracy mentioned earlier, which is across continents, across uh, uh, geographical areas, Africa and Asia. And so the scope of the project uh, varies determined by the goals, the budget, the donor uh, strategy, and the needs on the ground. You know, this is so interesting in that you you just raised so many different uh, elements. You raised this whole idea of intersectionality. You also raised the idea of, of, of definitions of need and, and specifying of need by communities. So you start off with a power transfer. The power transfer is you're not coming in and trying to leave an imprint you're trying to understand what types of needs, and then you take elements that Engender Health has and bring those to bear according to the definitions locally. And then the third thing that you talked about is it also depends on what donor investors want to invest in. So Tracy, let's talk about triangulating between the desires of an investor. Let's say I'm somebody who is distant from Sub-Saharan Africa, and I'm writing you a $10 million check, and I've got certain ideas, right? How do you maintain a balance? Because you want my $10 million check. Let's, let, let's, let's be practical here. But you also don't want me to define for Sakai what she needs, right? That is a power imbalance. I'm a guy, I'm writing a $10 million check, and all of a sudden my money speaks, no, 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 right? So how do you maintain that balance so that you're honoring Sakai and you're getting the funding that you need? 
Well, first of all, we are very happy to accept your $10 million check or anyone else's, and we will work with you to make sure we're meeting your goals, what the, whatever those are. Uh, I mean, as long as there's general alignment, there's just so many ways we can design a program that would, I think, get to whatever was wh- whatever was motivating you, right? As a donor, you're motivated by something. You want to save lives. You want to educate girls. You want to, um, you want to, be a good person. Now nutrition. What's that? Be a good person. You want to be a good person. Fantastic. And we have a lot of scope for being a good person. We can we can help you achieve that in lots of ways. What I will say though, Mark, is that you know, most of the donors that we're dealing with in practicality, they are like us. They're experts in this work. So whether we're dealing with a government donor, um, or a, a foundation donor or a UN system, they have almost, you know, related expertise to our team. So we find that, you know, sometimes we're we're working on the edges to make sure we're well aligned and that it's it the work is practical, that we can practically meet goals within the budget and the parameters and the timeline and, you know, lo- lots of lots of edges to the system. But we're rarely working with a donor who doesn't also know. So when we're designing a project, we're often designing with donors that are in the country where we are um, designing the program, or they have staff who have been there, or staff that used to work for Engender Health, or might in the future work for Engender Health. So it's it is a community where the the donors and implementers um, have a lot of that common basis. But what I would say at the core is that there's you know there's so much work to do and so many ways to get this work done. We can really meet the interests of donors um, in in multiple ways and bring those interests to our partners. And as Sakai said, design it with our partners and with the communities that that stand to benefit from the work. And when we all put our minds together, um, there's a lot we can figure out to do. And and you're pointing to something that is so very important. You're educating donors and you're in dialogue with communities. Mm-hmm. And so what you're, part of your function is triangulate uh, between people, whether they are in, in Africa or in another uh, geography or in the United States, you're triangulating with people who do not necessarily communicate with each other, but you're trying to help each each party to understand and convey. There's a whole infrastructure required for that. So as as we're going to transition to uh, another discussion, which we're talking to leaders on the ground, and this is one of those instances where Sakai, we're going to um, uh, invite the CEO to exit the scene so that the the spotlight can be on the local folks, but Tracy, before you do exit, uh, could you talk a little bit about how you ensure that messages are getting out broadly to supporters and potential supporters, and also that there is some connection that is assured between people on the ground with expertise on the ground and those donors, perhaps mediated by your staff but so that you you keep it real, that people are really connecting in a way that allows a transformation of society writ large and a rebalancing of power dynamics in the world so that women are respected by, by everyone and they share an equal power with what can be a male-dominated globe. Well, we speak to a number of different audiences. So we are speaking to donor audiences or potential donors. We're speaking to technical audiences, people who are, you know, going to develop the next, you know, project related to gender and HIV and contraception in another country related to the kind of work we do. So we we share information in multiple ways, including through technical briefs and journal articles and, and peer-reviewed journals. We share information at conferences, but we also try to put a lot of information up on our website. And I'd love for you to check it out at engenderhealth.org. And we share- I have it, information. On, I have it right here. Yo, good. See, it's right. It's it's there. It's bright. It's colorful. And it's through that, through our website, through our social media accounts, and we're on all the different social media platforms. We try to share the stories and the data. Some people want to hear the numbers. They want to know that the work that we did saved how many hundreds of millions of dollars in healthcare costs last year. 
Other people want to hear a story, the story of a peer educator who through her work in in sharing with other teens about um, reproductive health and, and, and their rights, that she became such a strong advocate that she represented her country at a G20 meeting. So we, we try to share that balance, but to really tell the stories with, with permission, with authenticity, and with some, you know, some level of, of feedback, making sure that our staff, I know some of whom you'll meet soon, and our partners are also learning from what we hear. So we don't want to be, we want to be a truly honest broker and facilitator of information. We're not looking to hold information as power, but to help with the flow of information from those who are working on programs and know them best out as broadly as we can, and then share the feedback back with our with our programs, partners, and staff. And I think it sort of follows the, the philosophy of engender health and our work of, of walking our talk around access to information, sharing power, co-designing, really working together authentically and, and, and with justice at the core, because that is the way we will address the injustice in society, will ad- address the disparities in health outcomes and in access to health care, and will help um, promote equal rights and equal access to to life for all. What a wonderful message. Um, it is basically the message of if we're going to change the world, we must be the change. We must engage everyone. We must share. We must be open. We must uh, try to meet people where they are, whether it's in hard data or in stories. Uh, we, we have to get people together in order to talk about the change we want to be and be that change. Tracy Baird, CEO of Engender Health, Sakai Chicoero, uh, Vice President of Programs of Engender Health. Thank you so much for opening this dialogue with us. We're going to now inflect to a discussion that is hosted by uh, Sakai, and we'll have some, some um, of your folks, Tracy, um, uh, who are leading some of these efforts on the ground Uh, But just wonderful, wonderful to have you both here. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mark. Great to be with you.